And the Bible reading for this morning's service is from Luke chapter 6, verses 6 to 11. And it's entitled, Jesus Heals on the Sabbath. On another Sabbath day, a man with a deformed right hand was in the synagogue while Jesus was teaching. The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees watched Jesus closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew their thoughts. He said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. So the man came forward. Then Jesus said to his critics, I have a question for you. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save a life or to destroy it? He looked around at them one by one and said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. At this, the enemies of Jesus were wild with rage and began to discuss what to do with him. Amazing, thanks Lou. Um, I'm just going to start by saying I woke up this morning and like I'd lost my voice. So um, if I just start to wither throughout the talk, then I'll, I'll do the quick version. Um, so yeah, apologies in advance. Um, uh, I'm going to start off uh, this morning by just giving you a bit of a story um, about uh, one of the many jobs uh, that I've had in the past. Um, so I used to work a couple of years ago at a place called the Watts Gallery, um, which is located, it's just outside of Guildford. Think like a national trust or like a English heritage type place, but it's, it's independent. Um, it's uh, the, the home, the studio, uh, and the gallery of uh, two Victorian artists, the dynamic duo George and Mary Watts. Um, and like today it's open as like a gallery, like a tourist attraction. There's a tea shop, there's like amazing gardens. Um, there's a chapel that was designed and like built by Mary Watts and like the women of the town. It's, it's a great place to go. Um, but my job uh, when I worked there, uh, one was looking after the volunteers. So we had a couple of hundred people who would act as tour guides or help in the shop. Um, but the other part of my job was to act as the duty manager for the site when it was open to the public. Um, and so part of my job was every morning when I was there to go around, there's, there was like three different sites um, that, that form like this one, this one attraction, uh, to go around all of the buildings, to unalarm them, to unlock them, to open them up ready for the public, and at the end of the day to go around almost the opposite route round and to lock everything up, close everything down, and then alarm the buildings so that they're safe, uh, so then I can go home. So it was quite a big responsibility. Um, and I was also one of the first responders, so if like a fire alarm went off or a security alarm went off, I would have to run from my desk that seemed to be on like the farthest side of anything. So I think they just wanted me to run around the place. Um, so I'd have to run and sort out the problem evacuate anyone if there was an actual emergency, um, but essentially make sure everything was fine, reset the alarms, um, and make sure everything was back to normal. However, the alarms across the entire site were the absolute bane of my life, and they never worked how I wanted them to work. There was always a problem. So, the marketing team uh, at my old job liked to burn their toast. Again, I think specifically on purpose, just to annoy me. So the fire alarms would go off. Uh, I would have to run and uh, silence the alarms. And then inevitably, uh, more times than not, they would bring up uh, on the little panel uh, where I had to go. You'd silence them, and then they would bring up a delightful fault code, which was some random collection of numbers and letters that meant a certain thing that indicated there was a problem with the alarms. So I knew that at the end of the day, unless I'd resolved that problem, they were not going to set. And this would happen fairly frequently. Um, so I would, um, I would have to be able to set these alarms before I could go home. 
And there was many times where I would be on site till like 10, 11 o'clock at night waiting for an engineer to come out because I just didn't understand what the fault code meant. I didn't understand how to fix the problem and I couldn't go home until the site was alarmed and was safe. However, there was one man that I called in my time of need. It wasn't my dad. I call him for most other things. There was a man called Matthew. Uh, who was our estates manager, and I knew that I could call Matthew if I had a real problem. If the alarms just weren't playing, uh, playing the game, I could call him. So he'd been part of the team that installed the alarms. He like personally knew the, the main engineer of this security company. He knew all of the fault codes somehow. He'd like memorized them. So he could just look at this weird selection of little numbers and be like, oh yeah, that's door three, and would know that, uh, that that was the problem. So every time I, I couldn't set these alarms, I would call Matthew, he would come over and he would sort it out for me. But every time, uh, every time I uh, called Matthew in, I watched him so closely and I asked as many questions as possible because I knew that uh, inevitably there would be a day where Matthew was on holiday and I wouldn't be able to call him in for help. So I knew I needed to rely on Matthew's knowledge, Matthew's understanding of how these alarm systems worked, so that when I was by myself and I really couldn't call on anyone for help, I would know and I would have learned enough from Matthew that I, uh, that I could hopefully fix them myself and I could go home before you know midnight. I needed Matthew's instructions to understand those alarm systems and to learn how to operate them correctly. So you could say it was wise for me to listen to Matthew, to follow his instructions, and then to put that into practice so that I could know how to fix those alarms properly in the future. And that's where I'm going to go with uh, our talk today. So I'm going to be looking a little bit more at the concept um, of wisdom, and specifically what we can learn today uh, about God's wisdom versus our own wisdom. So let's jump into our scriptures for today. So over the last couple of weeks, um, we've been working our way um, through our Luke Gospel sermon series. Um, and we've, we've got to the point where Jesus is at the beginning of his ministry. Um, but the last couple of weeks, we've, we've had a couple of stories where Jesus' teachings, the ministry that he's setting up, the, the miracles that he's starting to perform, are starting to draw the attention of the uh, the established Jewish authority at the time. And his teachings are really coming into conflict with the teachings of the Pharisees. So a few weeks ago, uh, Derek, uh, Phil's dad, came in and talked to us um, about a time where Jesus was, um, was questioned by the Pharisees about fasting and about prayer. And Je to paraphrase, Jesus says, you know, I didn't come here to... Uh, I'm not here to teach people how to do the same things they've been doing for the last hundred, hundreds of years. I'm here to do something new. That's what I'm all about. Last week we saw, uh, when Andy came to talk to us, we again saw how Jesus' teachings about the Sabbath uh, really came into conflict with those of the Pharisees. Um, and Jesus used his teachings to, to declare himself a prophet, a king, and a priest. Um, and if you want to catch up on them, then they're on YouTube, as always. Um, but what is Jesus teaching us this time um, on this Sabbath? So again, uh, he is, um, we are on another Sabbath day, uh, and we see Jesus this time not walking through fields of wheat, but uh, teaching in the synagogue. So this time, uh, in the congregation of the synagogue, there is uh, a man with uh, his deformed hand. And he has simply come this week to listen to Jesus' teaching. Interestingly, he never approaches Jesus. So often we see in the Gospels that Jesus heals people in response to their request or in response to their faith. Um, but this time we don't have any indication that, that this man interacts with Jesus at all um, before the healing happens. Um, he's simply there to listen. Instead, this time we see that Jesus initiates uh, this miracle healing of this hand, um, in, actually in response to the Pharisees, who, unlike the, the man with the, the deformed hand, 
they've attended for a very different reason. Uh, we have one man who we see there who is just uh, coming to listen and to learn and to, to hear Jesus' teaching. Whereas the Pharisees, we know by this point, they have clocked that, that this Jesus is someone who is teaching um, the conflicts their own. And they've come specifically to find something that he says um, that they don't agree with, that they can point to their own teachings, they can use to discredit him, um, and that they can, in doing that, they can point people back to themselves. They can cast um, Jesus in the light of, you know, he's not saying the right thing, he's not saying uh, what, what we believe, so, you know, everyone, don't listen to him, listen to us instead. But we know that Jesus uh, knows that the Pharisees are there. He knows what their motives are. And so he confronts them and he asks a question that I found when I was looking through this. It was kind of a bit of a weird question. He asked them, what's lawful on the Sabbath? What is the Sabbath made for, for doing good or for doing evil? And I think that this question, it really tries to get, it tries to get at the heart of why the Pharisees are there that day. And it really tries to question their motives. I think to understand exactly what Jesus is getting at and exactly the, the point that this question is, is getting to, we need to understand a bit more about the Pharisees. So if you know about the Pharisees already, then you can just tune out at this, at this point. Uh, but I'll just, for those of you who don't know, I'll give you a quick roundup of who the Pharisees were. So the Pharisees, we've, we, uh, we come into contact with them a lot through the Gospels and we, we, know, we, we hear of them uh, a lot. Um, but they were a group of people um, uh, back in ancient Israel who were uh, a kind of a group of scribes and teachers. There were people who were very highly learned in the law of Moses. So anyone could join this group, but it was, it was mainly consisted of scribes and teachers simply because they were the ones that, that their job was to, to know these, these things. Um, if you don't know what the law is, um, what I'm talking about is the, the set of instructions, and rules and guidelines that God gives to Moses when he takes uh, Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery. He gives Moses these laws. Um, that really describe who God is, how he wants Israel to live, and how he wants Israel to worship him. That's the law that I'm talking about. It's the written law. Um, so these, these group of Pharisees were highly learned in, in, in that. However, the Pharisees were a group. Uh, there's a couple of different groups of, of, um, of like teachers at this time. But the Pharisees in particular, they believed that worship of God was done properly by obeying the law as closely and as perfectly as possible. So that they wanted this law to be accessible to everybody in their everyday life. So whereas groups like the, the priests or the Sadducees, they thought that the law was something that the, the Jewish people could interact with and could interact with God solely at the temple. Whereas the Pharisees wanted that law to be applied to every, every part of someone's life, which sounds kind of good. Um, they, they thought that um, as soon as the whole of Israel were able to follow the law perfectly, then that was the point that God would be able to come and establish his kingdom on earth. So they wanted uh, this law to be uh, followed absolutely perfectly by everybody. Because of that, they were uh, really against the blurring of like Greek and Jewish culture um, that had come with the Romans. Um, and they were also quite a political uh, group. They, um, they wanted to influence key Roman political figures because essentially they wanted their concerns to be reflected in any laws that were being passed. So they wanted greater religious freedoms and uh, more rights um, to, to live um, in their culture and in their, their religious practices. So because of this, I'm sorry, I'm getting to the end. Like I went on a huge rabbit hole about like what the Pharisees believed and I thought it was inter interesting. Um, 
But because of this, essentially, the Pharisees were really interested in the parts of the law that people could apply to their normal life. So they weren't quite so interested with things like the sacrifices and the temple worship, because that was all kind of in hand. But they were really interested in things like purity rituals and the Sabbath, because those were the things that people could take to their ordinary lives um, and could, could put into place. They were also really, really keen um, on something called the oral law. So that differs slightly from the written law. The written law is the thing where if you go to your Old Testament and you look through all those like quite strange rules, that's the written law. Um, and that's kind of taken to, to be that those are the things that God directly said to Moses that were written down, that were passed on to Israel. So they're, they're the written laws. The oral law, the Pharisees believed that God gave at the same time as the written law, but it was more like a practical guide uh, and, or how to, to put these things into application into someone's everyday life. Not everyone believed that, though. Uh, groups like the Sadducees um, like, and uh, other groups of, of uh, Jewish teachers at that time, they believed that that oral law was something that, um, that men had had put into place and had added to God's law. So there's, there's uh, loads of different laws um, that the, the Pharisees were, uh, were teaching people. So if we look at today's example of the Sabbath, let's just quickly look at what the written law says. So Luke, could you get up Exodus 20? Fab. So this is the written law um, about the Sabbath. We're in Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11. I'll just read it off. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. And that's why the Lord blessed the Sabbath and set it apart as holy. So we, we know that one, right? Uh, that's um, In Exodus, we know that that's written down. We know that that is God's instructions to Israel and to us about what the Sabbath is. But the Pharisees also wanted to help people to keep the Sabbath. They really wanted people to be able to, to keep the Sabbath day of rest. So they taught people lots of practical instructions about how to not work. So again, if we look at today's example about the Sabbath, um, the Pharisees had a lot of uh, instructions about how to uh, care for the sick, um, and, and healing duties, and what was allowed and what wasn't allowed on the Sabbath, what was rest and what was not. So some of these things that the Pharisees would have been kind of adding along uh, with, with those rules about the Sabbath. Number one, on the Sabbath, people were allowed to work if it would save the life of a person who would otherwise die. So you'll be happy to know that if in ancient Israel you fell into a river and started drowning, and it was the Sabbath, Someone would be able to help you. It wouldn't be a case of people standing around being like, sorry, mate, it's a Saturday. Sorry. You would be able to save someone. It's okay. However, caring for the seriously ill was sometimes allowed, but there were certain restrictions and conditions. I don't know what those are. I don't know if you had someone ill in bed, whether you could bring them like bread and water, but is it work if you bought them a roast dinner? I don't know. However, treating minor ailments was prohibited. So if you cut yourself or fell over, like, sorry, that's tomorrow's problem. It sounds a bit strange, really. And one of the questions that I had as I was working my way through this was, does not working really mean that we are resting? Because we know from the written law, we know from from that verse in Exodus, that God gave the Sabbath so that we could find life through rest, so we could have regular time with him, uh, so that we could 
we could spend time with our families and we could spend time with, with God. But really, I think that the Pharisees, in, in their interpretation of the Sabbath, were adding a lot of these restrictions onto people. And I wonder if those kinds of rules, those kinds of where you could care for people and where you couldn't, what you could do and what you couldn't, are those kind of things really bringing people to know God? Were they bringing rest to people? Were they bringing life to people? Were they bringing people's hearts to God and helping them to know who he is? I think that the outward intentions of the Pharisees seemed really good. They wanted to take God's instructions and to follow them as perfectly as possible. But the problem was that they were trying to follow God's instructions by their own efforts and by their own understandings. And we know so many times we see Jesus calling particularly the Pharisees out for this. In doing that, they were becoming proud because they had placed their obedience to God upon uh, as being reliant upon their own wisdom. And I think that these are the motives that Jesus is calling into question today um, with his, his question to them. Were the Pharisees coming to God that day? Were they coming to the synagogue to learn about him, to listen to the scriptures? Or were they coming having already interpreted God how they wanted? And were they coming to judge people on their own interpretation of, of who they thought God was? I think for this, let's, um, I just want to really quickly look um, in a little bit more detail about the word wisdom because I think that that is what, uh, what we're learning about through this today. When you search for the definition of wisdom, you get the following. So wisdom, and if you search in Google, is defined as the ability to make good judgments based on what you have learned from your experience, from your knowledge, and your understanding. I think that sounds pretty good, right? That sounds pretty logical. You want to take what you, you know and what you've learned and your experiences and you're using all of that information to make decisions that inform your actions. That sounds good. And I think that this is what the Pharisees were doing. They were taking their own understanding of God's law, their experiences, what they'd been trained, um, and they were using all of these bits to inform themselves on what to do, on how to keep the Sabbath. But notice that this, uh, this definition is so centered upon ourselves. It's taking our own knowledge and our own experience and our own understandings to make our own decisions and our own judgments. I just want to go back to the example that uh, the, the story that I started off with, because would it have been wise for me at Watts Gallery when the sirens are blaring and I'm running, would it be wise for me to think, well, I've worked with gallery alarm systems before, I've locked up buildings before, I'm just going to use my, my own knowledge of what I know to, to solve this problem. I'm going to take that fault code and I'm going to force myself to understand what it means based on uh, all the little doors that I know could be a problem. Uh, I'm going to use my adrenaline from the sheer panic of having alarms going off and I'm going to use that to fuel what I do to solve this problem. I think maybe I probably could have solved it. I could have got the alarms to reset but I think that would have been based more on luck than on wisdom. And I think that this is what the Pharisees were teaching people, that their knowledge and understanding of God's law was helping them to make the decisions on how to keep the law, and that was the correct way to worship God. But this isn't what Jesus is, is telling us, and it's not what he is teaching us that wisdom is. Because in today's story, Jesus is forcing those Pharisees into a conflict. He's asking them on one hand, essentially he's asking them to choose. Is the Sabbath there for life? Are you going to come to me for life? Are you going to come to God? Are you going to come to rest to find life? Because if you're not, 
then that leads on to the opposite, which is death, which is evil, which is not doing things correctly. It's a really hard lesson. Um, and Jesus gives us loads of hard lessons throughout the Gospels. But I think luckily, he gives us an example uh, to show us how easy that hard lesson can actually be. Because when he calls to that man whose, ha uh, whose, whose hand is deformed, a man who simply came that day with an open heart to hear him speak, to learn about God, all he did was give him two commands. He told him to stand up and to hold his hand out. And this man, it seems that he didn't really know what was going to go on. He didn't ask for healing. I wouldn't, my, my, my first thought in that scenario, if I was him, wouldn't be like, I'm going to get my hand healed. I'd just be like, okay, I'm going to stand up. But he's healed anyway. I think true wisdom is like finding someone who is the master of those difficult alarm systems. It's like finding my, my great partner in crime, Matthew. Asking for his help to be shown what he knows so that I can understand those alarm systems based on his better knowledge and his better understanding, not on my own. Wisdom is recognizing that I don't know the answers. I'm not an expert in those alarm systems, but Matthew certainly was. And to receive his help as a gift so that I could learn those alarms myself. And I think that Jesus paints us a, a very similar picture today. True wisdom is coming to him. Putting aside all of our own needs to accomplish or even our needs to fully understand to get to grips with everything uh, that life can throw at us. It's just coming to him to listen, to be open, and to learn from him. I think so often, uh, as we go through the Gospels, the Pharisees seem like the bad guys, right? I mean, they are the ones that really plot against Jesus, but they're so often painted as the bad guys. But I wonder how often those of us who are Christians here, how often do we fall into the same trap that the Pharisees fell into? How often do we try to follow God? We try to follow what he wants for us, but we get stuck doing it in our way. For example, how often do we come to read our Bible and we come to it with our own set of feelings, our own uh, set of understandings, our own beliefs, the, the things that we want to see in the Bible, rather than laying down what we know and just allowing God to teach us himself. Sometimes I have to remind myself that the Bible is not just a book of cool life advice for Lauren and then some like weird stuff about sacrificing bulls that I'm just going to forget about because I don't understand that. The Bible is actually a book that talks about who God is. It's God teaching us who he is and telling us who he is. And if we can come just laying down all of who we are to just learn who he is and what he has to say to us, then that's where we find real teaching. Or how often do we pray for God to give us what we want, to find resolution to the problems that we're facing, but it's the resolution that we want to see. Or how often do we pray for things that we think God wants? I often think, well, God, you want peace, so I'll pray for peace. That makes sense. But then what happens when we don't see that? That we feel confused and disappointed when things don't turn out the way that we wanted them to? But again, I think that prayer isn't us coming to God with all of our requests and expecting him to answer them. Prayer is coming to God to put down ourselves and to ask that his will would be done, and to learn that he's good, despite whether things turn out how we want them to or not. For those of you here, maybe who aren't Christians, and who don't relate to the example of reading your Bible or praying, maybe you have a preconceived idea of who Jesus is, and what his teaching's all about, and maybe you approach him a little bit like the Pharisees, that you've got a lot of questions for him, um, but you kind of want to pick his arguments apart a little bit. But maybe instead of coming to Jesus with your own questions, 
Maybe instead a better way is to approach him with a curious and open heart and to just ask him what he might want to tell you today about himself. Because when we put our trust in our own wisdom, we will always be waging war against the ways of Jesus. We'll be like the Pharisees who saw a miraculous healing right in front of them and it did nothing to change their hearts because they were too concerned with following God in their own way that they missed that free gift that Jesus gives all who would just come to him. When we put our trust, however, in Jesus... When we recognize that he knows more than we could ever hope to understand, and when we follow him and trust in him, regardless of whether we understand everything in that moment, I think that's when we will truly learn from God himself. So I'm going to wrap up today with, um, with a practical thing that we can do. Because that sounds like a lot, right? It sounds like a lot to do. So how do we come to God with an open heart? Just to learn from him, how do we put down all of our baggage, all of our our preconceived ideas? How do we put down ourselves uh, and come to God? How do we submit to his wisdom rather than our own? So I thought I would end, uh, well, firstly, by saying that uh, uh, I wanted to lead us in some prayer. Um, But it's something that I think that we need to do every day in our walk with Jesus. It's not a one-time thing. It's... Uh, it's a, a lifetime of learning to put down what we want and trust in what he wants. But we can start off by praying together um, as we draw to a close. So, the way I thought that I'd do it is, I'm just going to say, uh, I'm going to lead us through some prayer. And if you're happy to, then you can follow along with me. I'm going to say a a little sentence at a time, and you can either repeat after me, either in your heart or out loud, if you would like to. Uh, I'm going to be praying uh, and asking us, uh, or sorry, asking God to, to, to help us come to him. If you're not comfortable praying uh, through this prayer, then maybe use this couple of minutes to just reflect on where God might be calling you to listen to him today. So, so let's do it. Let's take a couple of seconds um, and I will start praying. I'll leave a pause after each thing that I say and you can just echo this prayer in your own heart um, or out loud if you want. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that your knowledge understanding and experience is so much greater than my own. Thank you that your ways and your wisdom are so much better than my own. Lord, please forgive me for the times where I put myself first. For the times I've trusted in my own strength rather than to rely and trust in you. Lord, please open my eyes, my mind and my heart to you. Help me to come to you with an open heart. Help me to listen to you. Help me to know you and understand your ways. Lord, please help me every day to trust in you and not in myself. Because you are so good and so faithful. In your name. Amen.